Who's got it right? The Martians or the Terrans? I'm Roger and this is Bookshook and today I'm discussing the first half of December's book Vagabonds by Hao Jing Fang, translated by Ken Liu, published in 2020. So each month I take a book, split it in half and discuss it on the second and last Fridays. I'd love to know your thoughts on the book so far. Leave a comment below or if you're listening to the episode, send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. Welcome to Bookshook. So I've read up to page 332, Medal of Vagabonds. Although there are no major trigger warnings that I need to tell you about, there will be spoilers up to 50%. So let's just start off with a summary of what's happened so far in the book. Quote, Once a group of children was born on one world and grew up on another. The world they were born into was a tower of rigid rules. The world they grew up on was a garden of rambling disorder. One was a magnificent, austere blueprint. The other was a wild bacchanalia. The two worlds shaped the children's lives one after the other without seeking their consent, without consideration for their feelings, like two links in the chain of fate, sweeping them up in cold, irresistible tides. What had been put together in the tower was smashed to bits in the garden. What had been forgotten in drunken revelry was still memorialised in the blueprint. Those who lived only in the tower never suffered the loss of faith. Those who lived only for the pursuit of pleasure had no vision to strive for. Only those who had wandered through both worlds could experience that particular stormy night in which distant mirages faded away and countless strange flowers blossomed in the wasteland. So Mars has become colonised in the 21st century and the Martians have rebelled against their earthen overseers. There's now peace but there are two distinct types of society. There are 20 students called the Mercury Group, representing, quote, the desire to communicate, having spent the last five years on Earth, and they're now returning home on a ship. Quote, it was a huge ship, stairways connected, multiple decks filled with twisting passages and honeycombed cabins. Large storage compartments scattered around the ship resembled palaces fallen into ruin, their spacious interiors piled with goods and equipment, their dusty corners confessing to an absence of visitors. Narrow passageways connected these palaces with bedrooms and dining halls, and the knotty structure resembled the plot of some particularly complicated novel. It is the second half of the 22nd century. These 20 students are travelling home on this ancient ship that survived the war that ended about 40 years ago alongside two 50 strong delegations. One's from Earth and one is from Mars. Quote, bringing interesting goods to show Earth the wonders of Mars and vice versa. They're returning from the Bacchanalian Earth to this stringent, strict Mars. What horrible habits will they have picked up? Nose picking, texting at the table, not saying please and thank you. Let's see. Anyway, a young girl chats with the co-captain, Marcia. Now, Marcia's husband is called Garcia, the captain. Now, he was friends with the girl's grandfather, Hans. They like to keep it in the family in this book. They fought in the war between Earth and Mars together. Quote, For a long period after the end of the war, the Martians had to endure unprecedented hardships. The poor soil, the thin air, the perpetual lack of water, the dangerous level of radiation, each one could have been fatal and all were obstacles in the way of bare survival. Before the war, all development on Mars had been sustained by supplies from Earth and most of the food had to be shipped in. Mars was like an unborn child, still tethered to the mother world by an umbilical cord. Independence was like the pain of labour, and the baby with its cord cut had to learn to breathe and eat on its own. There were things that could not be obtained except from Earth, things that even brilliant minds could not create out of nothing, things like animals, beneficial microbes, macromolecules derived from petroleum. Without these, life could barely sustain itself, let alone thrive. Now, after the war, Garcia boards this ship, Mayarth, and it was the first ship to broker diplomacy with Earth. Now, the girl we find out is called Lua Ying, quote, a member of the Mercury group, her speciality, dance. And Ellie asked to give her grandfather Hans a message. Quote, sometimes the fight over the treasure is more important than the treasure itself. She is a dancer and described beautifully as a crane, another beautiful earthly 
metaphor, and there'll be more on all these earthly metaphors later. Now, Theon, the head of a large Terran corporation on Earth, now Terran is Earth, asks his filmmaker, Eco to film the dance de Luang for a documentary. Partly because she is the only granddaughter of the great dictator and current consul of Mars called Hans Sloan. The year we discover is precisely 2190 on Earth and it's 40 on Mars. And the ship is docking with Mars. The journey has come to an end. Eco, the Terran filmmaker, is in a hotel room with transparent walls. He's just come off May Earth and he is in Mars now. And he thinks, quote, what does all this transparency mean? The word transparent was politically significant. A room that should be one's own made transparent suggested surveillance. When all the rooms were transparent, it suggested mass surveillance. He could take this as a symbol of the conquest of individual privacy by the collective and turn it into a bit of political commentary, a critique. That sort of approach would be exactly what mainstream Earth opinion expected. His documentary would naturally be well received. The proponents of individualism on Earth had been waiting for just this kind of evidence, incontrovertible proof of the accusations levelled against the hell in heaven. It would also provide the Hawks with yet more support for an attack against Mars. Another attack on Mars. Poor Mars. Now he thinks about his filmmaking teacher called Arthur Davosky. Ika has a copy of his teacher's memories, quote, converted into ones and zeros. He goes to eat Martian food, quote, he picked up the tray and examined the food with interest, his first encounter with authentic Martian cuisine. On May Earth, the Terran delegation supplies had all come from Earth, and for the duration of the trip, they had no opportunity to sample Martian food. He had heard rumours about what the Martians ate, stories tinged with the bloodthirsty imagination of pirate tales. Some said that Martians ate worms grown in sand dunes, and others claimed that they ate plastic and metal debris. It was always the habit of people who had never gone anywhere to invent outrageous stories about faraway places to gain the self-satisfaction of an imaginary civilised person through manufactured fantasies of barbarism. Now he recalls his teacher's dying words, quote, to be interesting, rely on your head, to be faithful, rely on your heart and eyes. And language is the mirror of the light, don't forget the light by focusing on the mirror. Very deep thinking there. Now, Eco remembers Davosky asking him to take the chip containing his memories to Mars. Quote, An icy dagger plunged into his heart as he understood that his teacher was trying to dispose of his remains after death. He was pointing at his true self, saying goodbye to his memories with his decaying flesh. His words were muddled but calm, and that made Eco's eyes swell with hot tears. Eco considers anew the architecture of Mars. Quote, he had always thought that on Mars a precise, clean, mechanical aesthetic would reign supreme, but the reality turned out to be humane and natural, as though he had walked into a distant vale, far from urban bustle. Continuing on, Eco knew that focusing on the unique Martian aesthetic represented a shortcut. Each tiny ornamental difference from Earth would give audiences at home a sense of the exotic, mysterious and distant. This was a way to distance the scene from the observer psychologically, to reduce reality to an image in order to avoid confronting the new, but he didn't want to shoot that way. Now, Eco is hoping his films will, quote, be a medicine, a cure for the terminal disease plaguing Earth. Dawowski, his film teacher, stayed on Mars to study new film and technology. He sent his findings back to Earth on May Earth rather than returning in person. Some say he was detained because he had, quote, stumbled upon sensitive information. Other reports said that he wanted to stay to learn more valuable technology. And Eco wonders whether he will ever return to Earth. He makes some inquiries as to the location of a Luang and a Janet Brook, a film researcher. Now Luang is at the Mars port. She sees her grandfather Hans and the head of the Terran delegation, a man called Beverly. We hear how the first group of students were dispatched to Earth five years ago. Quote, Those who voted in the final tally had no clear idea as to what the students would experience on Earth. The decision makers had been born on Mars and they had only heard accounts of the noisy bustle on Earth, legends of a previous generation. The entire Martian Republic consisted of a single city, a habitat enclosed in glass. 
Here the land was literally a thing of the people, managed for the common wheel. There was no private ownership in real estate, no smuggling, no buying on credit, no banking. No one knew how children who had grown up in such a place would react to the grand bazaar that was earth, where commerce was the only rule and advertisements would bombard the children day and night. It's interesting, this idea of a communist Mars and a capitalist Earth. More on that later. Now, the two groups of Terran and Martian delegates stand in two parallel lines. Quote, The Martians, having grown up with less gravity, were much taller than the Terrans, which made the scene asymmetrical. And I think the stature of these Martians is a constant idea all the way through the book. Lu Ying remembers discussing the selection process with the other Mercury Group students and realises that there is no way she could have been selected without her grandfather's intervention. He moved in with her and her older brother, Rudy, when her parents died. When she arrives home, quote, after five years in the noise of earth, she had returned to home as tranquil harbour, but she seemed to have lost that primitive, heartfelt love of home permanently. She greets her brother, Rudy, and learns that he has become the fifth electromag atelier. Rudy asks how her trip was, and Lu Ying doesn't know how to describe the feeling of being back on Mars. She recalls the beautiful experiences she had on Earth. Quote, In one of the great cities in East Asia, she had lived on the 180th floor of a skyscraper. The dance school she attended also trained in a studio in the same building. The building itself was a steel pyramid, like a mountain. Inside was a world complete unto itself. Elevators raced up and down the slanted edge, and people came and went like the surging tide. In Central Europe, she had lived in an old, abandoned house in a suburb, where the metropolis met the open countryside. The land there belonged to a merchant, who came there only once a year, and trespassers weren't allowed. She had gone there in search of inspiration for her dance. The fields were full of swaying golden wheat and wild birds. Flowers bloomed and wilted like the coming and going of clouds. In the open plains of North America, she had lived in the heart of an artificial scenic park, surrounded by wilderness. Terran officials had invited all the Martian students to vacation at the park. There the prairie stretched under the big sky like a song, and loneliness showed itself in every bare tree branch every passing bird, every cold glinting star. From time to time billowing clouds raced in from every direction and lightning bolts hung from them like tree branches while trees reached up from the earth like frozen lightning. On a plateau in Central Asia, she had lived in a tent city at the foot of snowy mountains. There she joined reversionist friends who had gathered there in mass protest. The mountains were pure white at the top, where the peaks poked into the clouds. From time to time, the clouds dissipated to reveal the golden glow of the sun against the snow. The tent city had been full of passionate youths from around the world who shouted slogans while linking arms, protesting against the system, until the system crushed the movement. The tent city was wiped away in a storm of violence, but the snow-capped mountains shone in the sun, unmoved. Before going to Earth, she had never seen any of these things. They didn't exist on Mars, and perhaps never would. There were no skyscrapers on Mars, no countryside, no absentee owners of vacation villas, no lightning, no snow-capped mountains, no blood from dragged-away protesters either. She had experienced so much on Earth, but she didn't know how to describe it. She'd gained so many memories, but lost her dream. She'd seen all kinds of exotic scenery, but home now seemed out of place. She had no words for any of it, all of it. Now she tells Rudy she shouldn't have been picked and was selected in at the last minute. She suspects he knows something, and he does admit that grandfather felt that a change of scene would help Lu Ying after the death of her parents when she was eight. Now she's now 18. She goes to see her grandfather. He is dressed in a tuxedo for the night's delegation and she delivers the message from the captain and they discuss how tensions between Earth and Mars are very high. He's holding a photo of her parents. It's the 10 year anniversary of their death tomorrow and Lu Ying can't bring herself to ask why she was selected. Now there's a main question here. Will Lu Ying find out exactly why she was sent to Earth? At the Terran Mars delegation, the Martians have made a huge effort, but the Terrans don't really notice because of cultural misunderstandings, and partly due to the Martians not advertising or boasting to the Terrans about the effort they've made. There'll be more on that later. Juan, a friend of Luang's grandfather, bitterly describes to Mr. Beverly, the head of the Terran delegation, how his grandmother died in a Terran bombing raid. 
Ultimately, he has an outburst and stands up looking distraught. Luoying believes the outburst is to do with the treasure that Garcia, the ship captain on the Maeth, mentioned previously. Remember, quote, sometimes the fight over the treasure is more important than the treasure itself. Luoying reflects on this and thinks, quote, the democratic process among the Terran delegates was the fight over the treasure. Some vague outline of the situation was emerging in her mind, but she still didn't understand the nature of the treasure the Terrans were fighting over. And now the big question here is, what is the treasure the Terrans are fighting over? I have a feeling it will be something intangible like desire for better things. Now we move to Eco's viewpoint. I feel like Luang and Eco are two sides of a similar coin. Eco is the young Terran filmmaker working for the big corporation. Luang is the young Martian student, dancer. He, as a filmmaker, is about what appears on the surface and perhaps Luang, as a dancer, what happens on the inside? What do you think? Now he goes to see Peter Beverly, the Terran leader of delegates, who used to be a movie star and, quote, cared very much how he was seen through the lens. Remind you of anyone? Perhaps Arnold Schwarzenegger? Again, is that a comment on the Earth's vanity and obsession with outer appearance? What do you think? Now Eco notices that Mars is not the autocratic evil planet that the Terrans are painting it as and asks Peter Beverly whether he should highlight this in a film. Quote, to show democracy functioning on Mars was to challenge the very foundation of the narrative about the Red Planet. It would lead to admission that politicians on Earth had lied, that the propaganda against Mars was based on prejudice and envy rooted in defeat. Eco wasn't afraid of making waves, but he knew what was politically correct for a filmmaker to show. As an official member of the delegation, he knew he was subject to constraints. Now Peter brushes him off with out even giving a proper answer. Now, I'm getting a strong sense of a real world politics creeping into this novel. I'm trying to block it out. I'm really hoping that this isn't a novel rooted in a desire to issue propaganda for or against a current real world political system ran over. Eco considers himself an quote, anti-establishment reversionist. And as he turns to leave, quote, he glimpsed through the door, Peter's wife putting the finishing touches on her makeup. About 10 years younger than Peter, she was also a famous actress. Their romance had always been conducted in front of cameras. From the first kiss to the birth of their son, Peter was skilled at the role of model husband, romantic and appropriately spontaneous. Their marriage looked perfect and he always made sure that she accompanied him everywhere. Eco, who had seen many men move from acting careers into politics, but so few of them seemed to understand the importance of the women's vote. Peter was one of the few. Now, is this a comment on the failure of the democratic system? That the vote is not worth anything because you're voting for something superficial? More on that later. What do you think? Now, Eco travels to see the film archive researcher Janet Brooke, who works at the Tarkovsky Institute. He continues to reflect on how Beverly is, quote, not wise, and a, quote, hologram, and, quote, his real self has faded into illusion. The Martian filmmaker seems, surprise, surprise, really nice. She comments on how they make flats and holographic films, unlike the Terrans who see flats as outdated. And she also explains how film publishing works on Mars. Quote, you call something a film only if you can publish it, but on Mars the definition is purely technical. Any kind of audio-visual record is classified as film. You publish your films on the web, divided by genre, but we don't do things that way. Our films are all stored in the central archive under each person's name. Since everyone can make dramatic narratives, factual documentaries, records of experiments, or industrial footage used as raw data, there's no need to separate them. And a few pages later, she continues the theme by saying, quote, On Earth, Arthur Davosky, that's Eco's film teacher and Miss Brooks' lover, was very successful, but he had to constantly worry about the commercial success of his next film. That isn't the case here. All of our incomes are set based on age, regardless of the atelier we have joined, or our accomplishments. All of our films are uploaded to the central archive, and anyone is allowed to view them without paying for the privilege. Money isn't something we worry about. She explains how glass is more common on Mars because natural resources don't allow for other building materials. I'm thinking, ha we have been led down the same garden path as those delegates in the hall scoffing at the cotton tablecloths and simple foods. 
Eco criticised the Martian culture for surveillance in its use of glass without knowing the true reason for its existence. I was quite won over by Eco's argument on surveillance in the hotel room. I fell into the very same trap that he did. Some very clever writing. But I wonder if this will backfire. I feel like I don't quite trust the narrator to tell me the truth of things at first. I mean, let's look at the narration on transparency from page 26. Quote, what does all this transparency mean? The word transparent was politically significant. A room that should be one's own made transparent suggested surveillance. When all the rooms were transparent, it suggested mass surveillance. He could take this as a symbol of the conquest of individual privacy by the collective and turn it into a bit of political commentary, a critique. Now, who is thinking and saying, quote, when all the rooms were transparent, it suggested surveillance? Is that a narrator? The implied author or Eco? What do you think? Anyway, continuing the narrative, Eco finds out that actually the glass can be darkened to ensure privacy. Quote, Eco felt quite silly, like me. He remembered the grand conclusions about Martian society he had drawn from the transparent walls and was glad that he didn't commit those to permanent record. He was so steeped in the context of Earth that it was natural for him to fall into the assumptions and political symbolisms prevalent on Earth. But starting the previous night, he was coming to realise the dangers in such carelessness. It wasn't just that he risked injecting subjective bias, but also that he couldn't get at the objective facts. He wanted to send a message to Earth. There was nothing more dangerous than jumping to conclusions. I predict this is going to be the message of the entire novel. Now, Miss Brooks says there's no such thing as total opacity. She's implying that although Terrans may think they have privacy, they don't. Eco tells her that Dvorsky died and she starts crying and Eco thinks, quote, he found her beautiful. There was nothing that enhanced a person's beauty more than genuine emotion. Just to hammer home that people who are surface like Peter Beverly are the nasty guys. She tells him that she can view Dvorsky's films anytime in the Central Archive. On Earth, media can be bought and sold, but on Mars it was freely available to all. Quote, Ike knew how to paint the treasure chest so that it aroused a desire to pay for the privilege of opening the lid. Whereas on Mars, quote, to take and to give were both duties, while money was allocated to everyone without regard to their participation in this exchange of ideas. Eco believes that Davosky must have defected to Mars. And then Eco heads to the dance school. He sees Luang practicing her dance. That's funny how no one ever chooses to use the privacy glass feature on Mars. Why is that? What do you think? Lu Ying is met by a boy who gives her a hug and Eco reflects that, quote, the overall impression was one of being completely at ease, rather like the mood of Mars City itself. There was no sense of rush, of desperate need, rather everything was without guile, artless. It was such a stark contrast to the world Eco came from. He lived in a city whose prosperity was based on the entertainment industry. People rushed everywhere like fluttering birds and obsessed over their riddle-like relationships and statuses. He was used to the desperate need to be alluring and the harried sense of insecurity. But here, everyone strolled around and paused to chat in the street like they had all the time in the world. Eco realises that he also, quote, lived in a crystal box since long before he had come to Mars an imprisoning box of a capitalist society of commerce and advertising. What do you think? It's at this point in the novel that I think I'm going to have to just gloss over all the pro-Martian, anti-Terran sentiment that is pervading the novel until some different ideas begin to appear. Now, Lu Ying and Anka, the boy, walk to a station. Quote, both of them enjoyed walking. When have you read a sentence like that in an award-winning novel before. It seems so loaded. Of course, is the implication people on Terran don't enjoy walking because they're so lazy and unhealthy and need to rush to get their next sale? Rant over. What do you think? Now, Liu Ying is concerned that the adjustment to less gravity is affecting her dance. She is performing in 20 days a, quote, headline act at the World's Fair. And we learn from Anka, who's in the aerospace force, that his, quote, flight system got a 50% increase in budget due to Ceres. They agree it's more likely rising tensions with Tehran. 
and Luong gets home and overhears Hans's archons, that's magistrates, discuss how they need, quote, hydraulic engineering, which is knowledge in exchange for their, quote, controlled nuclear fusion engine. They need water knowledge to create water on the asteroid series and use that to create water. And they're worried the exchange will give the Terrans knowledge to power warships. Hopefully, we'll find out that the free exchange of ideas leads to a better universe. Now, Lu Ying is patronised by Uncle Zhuan on the way out, who, although she is 18, still treats her like a child and calls her, quote, little bunny, and lifts her like a child and spins her around. Lu Ying mentions his outburst over the Terran bombing raid that killed his grandmother, and he responds with, quote, little bunny, you have to understand that in a negotiation, someone has to play the role of the reasonable adult, while someone else has to scare them a bit like a madman. Your grandfather loves being reasonable, which means I have to go scare people. And Lu Young thinks, quote, I want to understand what lies behind the words, not just the words themselves. She reflects that life on Tehran was just a champagne flavoured fun bubble where politicians discuss petty matters, unlike on Mars, where serious issues like, quote, how to divert the orbit of some asteroid or dwarf planet, or how to attempt to build a new model for human survival, collecting and cataloguing the fruits of human civilization, or how to ascertain the sources of errors in simulations of human history, and so on. More Terran bashing. That's the last I will quote, I promise. In fact, on the very next page, Lu Ying reflects on having to find an atelier, which is a trade body that one sticks to for life, who will define her life plans, unlike the freedom she had on Earth. There's going to be more on that later. Her parents, a low artist, joined an engineering atelier, and she discovers a note in her mum's memorial book saying that her mother had no atelier. Quote, Adele, that's her mother, officially became a person without an atelier. Now, I'm not sure whether this is a metaphorical statement, but I think the answer to that question is in the word official. Perhaps this is why she had an early death, the lack of an atelier. Lu Yong thinks, quote, Mum didn't want to register either. A bittersweet feeling filled Lu Yong's heart. She felt connected to her mother's soul, despite the yawning gulf of death. She was not alone in her confusion, and her own troubles seemed suffused with her parents' influence and legacy. Her vagabond days and consequent anxiety were not so strange after all. She had wandered afar only to return to the path her mother had chosen. She discovers a note from her grandfather saying, quote, Forgive me. So their death was at his hands. Perhaps they didn't fit into the strict regulated society. Maybe or it could be a red herring. We move to Eco, looking through Davosky's films. Eco muses that they would have survived in the Terran film market, which relied on, quote, an illusion to provide the comfort of conversations to the lonely or something with the fragrance of perfume, the stench of blood, an enigmatic oracle and scenes of brave heroes saving beauties through valiant struggles. In Terran films, quote, no longer was the focus on details like framing, camera technique, movement and so on, but all effort was devoted to complicated plots. But Dvorsky was showing Eco that the best way to speak the language of film wasn't to focus on novelty, but on uniqueness. Now, in a nice example of ekphrasis, which is describing a visual medium, the narrator describes one of these films. Quote, in one film, the protagonist was a young man who suddenly got the idea of taking a photograph of himself every day right before he went to bed in order to have a record of how he changed. At first, the man needed to set an alarm to remind himself, but eventually it became a habit, a ritual to be followed without thinking every night after eating, talking and bathing. One day, after getting off work and returning home, the man was bored and decided to look through his photographs. He prepared dinner and poured himself a glass of wine, sat on the couch in darkness and scrubbed through the photos one by one as they were projected onto the wall. The camera followed his gaze and went to the wall, showing the viewer one photo after another. At first it was impossible to see any change, but gradually the man aged. The sequence reached the man as he was at that moment, but didn't stop. Portrait after portrait, the man's face wrinkled and his back hunched, until finally the sequence stopped with him as an ancient, shriveled figure. Abruptly, the camera pulled back to the man sitting in the dark, remote control in hand. He had died from old age, but his dinner remained on the coffee table, untouched. The camera lingered on him, and the silence was filled with the solemnity of death. 
Eco reflects that the films he, Eco, made on Earth were similar to Dukovsky's in terms of impact. Quote, There was no room for the pursuit of higher ideals in a world dedicated to instant commerce. Like an apple tree grown in the southern part of Kansas, he didn't bear many fruits, but what he did produce had a special flavour of nostalgia. On Mars, however, quote, The creators didn't worry about making a living, didn't have to have release plans, didn't make advertisements, didn't chase after profit. It was a way of life that Eco couldn't even imagine, but he found himself deeply drawn to it. For him to not have to worry about food and rent, to spend all day discussing creation and inspiration was more ideal than anything else. Now, Eco goes to the World's Fair to film. He sees Luying and a friend of hers arguing with the Terran boy, this is Peter Beverly's son, over the difference in politics between the two worlds. In particular, how Terrans manufacture desire in order to sell products. And there'll be more on that later. They also discuss the difference on Terran and Mars between distributed computing, like the web on Terran, and a centralised server on Mars. Also, on the replaceability of computers that only last three years on Terran, with computer terminals on Mars that can't easily be replaced. Eco stops a chat and Lu Ying tells him she wants to be a dancer. Eco says, quote, why not a great dancer? And Lu Ying becomes saddened and when questioned as to whether she, quote, feels it's not so good here, she says, quote, the problem isn't whether things are good here, but you can't think it's not good here. Are the Martians trying to suppress the thoughts of their people? Now, Chania, Lu Ying's friend, says that her grandfather sentenced Lu Ying's parents to death by mining. Lu Ying is horrified with the blunt truth, and they consider that it may be because she didn't choose an atelier. Lu Ying says, quote, The biggest problem with our world is that you can't think it's not good. Everyone must pick an atelier, must live the way we're supposed to live. The more I think about it, the more scared I become. If your guess is right and refusal to register is a capital crime, then we don't even have the freedom to leave the system. What a terrifying world. If one could live only by instinct, that would be true happiness. She goes on. No one commits crimes here because there's nowhere to run to. We're all stuck and sooner or later we know we'll be caught. Sadness clouded her gaze. You have to live the way you're supposed to because there's no getting out. Now Lu Ying goes to Uncle Lark, who's the Register of Files, to find out why they were sent on a mining ship. Lark ultimately responds with the reason being, quote, threat to national security. And her mother's records stopped when she stopped having an atelier. When Lu Ying asks to see her grandfather's file, Lark says, quote, Everyone's life has a private part, a part that belongs only to memory. That part is like the reef under the sea. While we only have the right to monitor the ships on the surface, no one has the right to pry into his life outside of his official duties. So we have a major question here. Why doesn't she just question her grandfather outright? Why did you send my parents away? And will she find out Hans's secret past? Now, Eco and Janet meet to discuss Davosky. Now, Janet had a relationship with Davosky when he was on Mars. Even though he left a wife and child at home, she believed he returned to see the wife and child. But Eco says that's not true. Eco thought he returned to seek medicine for his cancer. But Janet says he wouldn't have been allowed on board May Earth without a clean bill of health. Eco gives the chip ultimately to Janet with Davosky's memories on it and mentions that he wanted it delivered to someone beginning with B. Janet Beverly doesn't think it was her though. Remember that B, okay, it's important. Just before Davosky left for Earth, he took the, quote, plans for the central archive, which contained, quote, the secrets of atomic storage to take them to Earth. Quote, he went to the first optical electrical atelier. Now remember that's important as well which was responsible for maintaining the Central Archive's hardware. The Central Archive works on the principle of atomic storage, where each atom's charge transitions are treated as zeros and ones. The information density is extremely high, allowing unprecedented capacity. Arthur obtained from the Atelier the plans for the Central Archive and brought them to Earth. Janet continues, quote, he had hoped to construct a cave of information, a vast cave capable of holding all the wonderful thoughts of humanity and to which all were welcome. Earth lacked anything comparable and so he had begged and pleaded until he got the plans from the Martian researchers. The moment he did, he left. That was the business he needed to take care of on Earth. 
Now we've got a question here. What did Davosky do on earth to build the archive? Now Liu Ying meets Rudy at his work and she says that their mother probably needed to be punished for, quote, instigating an ideological revolution about not registering with an atelier. Rudy does not admit that she is right. He tells her the Terrans want the fusion technology and that Uncle Juan may decide to strike first, even though his grandmother was killed in the last war. She's upset at the news that her beloved grandpa, Ronan, a friend of her grandpa, who consoled her when her parents died, has died. And then Liu Ying dances at an open rehearsal attended by Theon, who's the director of the Thales Group Conglomeration on Earth, who has commissioned Eco to film her. There's a beautiful description of her dance. Quote, she was now one with the dance and she was revisiting all the spots she had been to during her time on Earth. She was the girl from the myth, journeying through a war-torn land, facing down hostile stairs. She wandered far until the scenes she had witnessed became parts of herself. Every bright sunlit field, every snowbound mountain, every house, river, rock and fence that had flashed before her eyes in this all too brief life. She was a montage of all of them. No, she didn't create them, they created her. They welcomed her in every corner, embraced her in every moment. Piece by piece, they moulded her out of nothingness. She was simply realising them for the audience, an unceasing string of moments of realisation. Theon says he's utterly devastated he didn't witness her dance on earth. And Luyang mistrusts his sentiment. She, quote, saw in his eyes a hint of mockery and something much more complicated. She didn't know what he wanted. Now, ultimately, he wants the design for Giel's clothes. Now, Giel is a friend of Lu Ying. It's some clothing that she's wearing and it's sparkling with lights. But Lu Ying intervenes in the hope of using the information for a bargaining chip with Earth to perhaps stop the war. Seems a bit far-fetched. Now, Theon chats to Giel about her design and Eco warns her not to give it away lightly because on Earth he will make only a very small amount to keep the price artificially high so that only a small number of people will be able to buy it. Giel retorts with, quote, But it's not fair. Everyone should be equal. And Eco says, Equality is nice in theory, but if everyone were equal, who's going to buy? Disparity drives desire. It's only by keeping Mystify out of the reach of most people that they'll covet it. Mystify is the name of the material that she's invented. Theon is going to say that Mystify represents a sense of who you are. To wear Mystify clothing makes you noble, elevated, full of ideals. It turns you into a princess of Mars. He goes on. Many people, some of them girls like you, will believe the lies. They follow his direction and think only of jewellery and clothes. Of famous brands, their hearts are empty, but they think by buying and buying they will possess a soul. Now Luang says that not all girls on earth are like that. It's a bit of sexist thinking creeping in. I'm sure many boys will desire this design too. I have a feeling that this dress as I met at some point create harmony in the solar system between Mars and Earth. Will stop nuclear war. Beauty and art, represented by the dress design, will defeat science and technology, represented by nuclear fusion and warfare. Let's see, hey. In the very next paragraph, we have this quote from Eco. Quote, He's going to wield it like a weapon, a weapon for manufacturing desire, a weapon for generating a sense of status envy and feelings of inadequacy. He's going to use the weapon to control the girls on Earth, to make money from them, to give himself power. Liu Yang is upset her dress bargain plan didn't work out as planned because of Eco's intervention. Quote, Maybe my whole idea is absurd. It's like trying to stop a warship with a flower to prevent a war with a fluttering dress. But Eco, he's pleased that he stalled the deal. He says the girls on Earth, quote, Pursue nothing but the chance to buy the next outfit. And Liu Yang retaliates with, Quote, no, or at least that's not all. Do you know why my friends on earth buy clothes? To express themselves. Even though they were shaped by their surroundings, they want to be unique. Whether designing clothes or buying clothes, the fundamental impulse is the same. They can't choose the world they live in or how that world operates, but they want to live their own lives to find out who they are. That is all. She's worried about getting an atelier and says to Eco, quote, you don't know that an atelier is for life. Though switching isn't forbidden, it's extremely rare for anyone on Mars to change ateliers. Everyone climbs the career ladder rung by rung, spending a whole life within the confines of two parallel lines. If I had never been to Earth, I suppose it wouldn't bother me, but I have been there. You know the lifestyle of everyone on Earth. Free to come and go, free to hop from profession to profession. 
Luyang is upset that Iko has been covertly filming her. She doesn't confront him and say, delete the film please, she just runs away. And then she goes on to reflect on the different upbringing ideas of freedom on Earth and Mars. Quote, On Earth, everyone had told her that they were free and taken pride in such freedom. She'd experimented with their freedom and knew that they were right. She had loved that sense of being untethered, of being adrift. But she also remembered that when she was a child in the classrooms on Mars, she had been told that only Martians were free. To be free from worrying about the basic necessities of life, to have an atelier of their own, meant they didn't have to sell their creative freedom for money. Her teachers told her that when a person had to sell their thoughts for money to buy bread, then that person was doomed to be enslaved by the struggle for survival. And what they created no longer represented them, but the will of money and commerce. Only on Mars was humankind free. Now that she lived in both worlds, she wasn't sure which chains were heavier. The system that ensured everyone had no more and no less than what they needed, or the poverty that resulted from the struggle for survival. But she did know that all humans loved freedom, and the more their ways of life differed, the more that fundamental commonality prevailed. She finds a secret password of her mother's digital 3D diary and finds the words, quote, Sometimes you think you've got life all figured out, but then a ray of light appears and makes you doubt everything. It's impossible for us to ever master life, and understanding it is an ongoing, interminable process of self-reflection. Only connect. Conversation is soul. She goes on to read about a teacher her mother received the year Luang was born. And then the diary is broken by Eco logging into her space. They are brought together in this virtual space. It transpires that Lu Yong's mother was good friends with Janet Brooke. Lu Ying says that her father used to work for the Optical Electrical Atelier, which is in charge of the Central Archive hardware, just before he died. Eco thinks there may be a link with the deaths because remember that Davosky quote, obtained the plans from the Optical Electrical Atelier for the Central Archive and brought them to Earth. So perhaps Dvorsky was given that cancer to stop him from creating the central archive on Earth? Now, a membody, which is a kind of simulation based on the electrical imprint of the brain of Uncle Ronan, appears. Now remember, he was the lovely grandfather to Lu Ying. He doesn't recognise Lu Ying, but he leads him to a second Tower of Babel in the making, hence the B that Dvorsky wanted his neuro pattern chip to be given to. Quote, it was Babel that integrated generalised language that accommodated science, art, politics and technology within the same spirit. Humanity was building a second Babel, a second attempt at climbing to heaven. The conversion of language and mutual understanding. Babel, the tower's name was Babel, its first letter was B. Now Eco muses on whether his teacher wants his neural pattern to reside here or not. Well, of course he does. I like the way that the implication is that the only the most smart and most creative minds will be allowed here. Maybe I'm being cynical. Let's see. I also like the idea of unified languages and, quote, piecing incomplete reflections together into the truth. I think it foreshadows Mars and Earth uniting together to form a lovely, happy solar system full of truth and light. Where's that wishful thinking? What do you think? Anyway, the next chapter is an anagram of the author's name, Ying Huo. It's almost a unification of the two different parts of her name, Hao and Yang Fan. A nod to her theme of unification of language in the previous chapter, perhaps. In this chapter, we have the dance show of Lu Ying. She begins, but she falls, unfortunately, and ends up in hospital. Rudy and Eco visit Lu Ying in hospital and are rudely interrupted by a Mars security official who accuses Eco of sabotaging the performance. Rudy tries to protect Eco, but the official whispers something in his ear to shut him up. He then accuses Eco of accessing the central archive and its heart, the Tower of Babel. Now, Eco does not want to incriminate Janet Brooke, so he keeps quiet. The highest of the high Terrans and Martians enter. The Martians accuse Eco of trying to, quote, manipulate the vote by infiltrating the central archive. They press him further, but he remains quiet until Lu Ying limps in and lies on Eco's behalf. Quote, I let him in. When they ask why, she puts it down to infatuation for him. The doctor says she won't be able to dance again. She asks him if her grandfather punished her parents. Rainey, the doctor says Hans did, but that his hands were tied. I'm thinking, hold on, Lu Ying, you don't know this guy. He's a doctor, a brand new character, and you're asking him all your pressing questions. Why is this? He says, quote, 
Hans supported economic freedom and freedom of careers. Your parents wanted these more than anything else, but he couldn't possibly show any support. If he did, the entire unity of the central archive and the unity of our economy would collapse. He understood the necessity of ordering Martian life in this manner, but he also understood that the spiritual freedom of creation is often conditioned upon the freedom of the individual to direct their own life, their environment. Yet, as the consul, he couldn't voice an opinion like that. Yeah, I'm thinking, but he could have stood up for his children. And I'm thinking, what about patient confidentiality? That's been thrown right out the window with this doctor, Rainey, when he's talking freely of her grandfather. I guess he's a family doctor then. Listen to this. Luang says, quote, What kind of man is my grandfather, really? She asked after a long pause. Rainey said slowly, Your grandfather is an old man with too much on his shoulders. Lu Ying could no longer hold back her tears. The doubt that had seized her heart for so many days was in those tears, as were the yearning and anxiety that had built up over 1,800 days. Dr Rainey, do you make a study of history? No, said Rainey, but everyone knows something about history, something unique to their experience and understanding. Can you tell me more? It's too late tonight, perhaps another day. What an authorial cop-out, it's too late tonight. Then there's a cloying scene with two of her male friends who turn up. One of them is described as, I quote, his dark round face looked adorable. Eco reflects that even his films, although art house, are fundamentally driven by capitalism. The idea of showing his films for free, as happens on Mars, seems outlandish on Earth. He resolves to promote a central archive on Earth, quote, to construct a public space, a forum in which everyone was responsible for their own thoughts, but no one would profit from their own language, Babel. When he tries to log into the central archive, he discovers that his access has been revoked. Now, before Eco leaves for Earth, he shows Lu Ying a holographic film of her performance. Quote, when she saw her holographic self, she suddenly realised that the point of memory was in fact to close off the past. Once her memory had been entrusted to something tangible, she could go on to be a different person without worrying about change, about losing the past, about negating her yesterday. Her past self had found its separate existence and she was free to go on her own way. She obviously doesn't understand the impermanence of memory and how often we recreate our memories. Now, Theon is going to profit from the trip to Mars. Eco, however, reflects on how he wants to, quote, gather all the mirrors in the world and piece together the broken lights. What a romantic. War is averted due to the petty rivalries between the Americans and the Europeans. Quote, neither wants to share their technology with the other, which means that no one on Earth wants fusion engines anymore. And they end up bartering for tube trains and, quote, magnetic moment walls, whatever they are. Now, Theon wants them for his commercial theme parks, a kind of IMAX screen, I guess. Eco leaves on the mere earth, and Lu Ying reflects how she is now severed from Earth. Then we go on to part two called Cloudlight. It begins with a prologue. Lu Ying asks why wars are fought, and Dr. Rainey says, quote, freedom. Now, remember, he's just a 33-year-old nobody in my book. Okay, he's a doctor, but why give him such status? Maybe he has a backstory that will be revealed later. Leon responds with, quote, what is freedom? And Rainey counters with, what's your definition? And she says, I don't know. That's the biggest question of my life. And again, we have a question. Will Lu Yong learn what real freedom is? Will it be based in any one society, Earth or Mars? Or will she discover that freedom is a personal inner concept not defined by society? I hope not. We've got another question. She recoils at people calling the grandfather she loves a dictator when she knows he killed her parents. Why would she refer to him as, quote, someone I loved? Why does she love him? Is it a cultural thing that you love members of your family without question on Mars? And there's another question. Is Dr. Rainey going to end up doing something horrible to Lu Ying? He's portrayed as such a nice professional man, someone your daughter should marry, but I don't trust him. She's too scared ultimately to go to her grandfather with all her questions, but Rainey does agree to help. He says that he helped Hans with, quote, a matter of engineering in the past, and therefore he has special privileges. So another question, what is this matter of engineering Rainey helped Hans Sloan, who's doing his grandfather with, and what privileges is going to be helpful for her? Interestingly, Rainey refers to a set of blocks with words on them. Quote, 
Rainey liked to play games with words. When he was a boy, he had a set of toy blocks based on words, which influenced him greatly. During his lonely childhood, the blocks brought him endless imagined possibilities and the comforts of companionship. There's a strong reference here to the Babel Tower, I believe. Hans asks Rainey for his advice on an engineering project. There are two proposals referred to as, quote, migration and continuation. The former advocated moving all Martians into a crater and constructing an open-air ecosystem. Supporters of this are called climbers, while the latter advocated remaining in the crystal box that was Mars City and turning the water of Ceres, that's the meteor they have captured, into a river flowing around it. And supporters of this are called waders. Both proposals had advantages and difficulties, and they drew about the same amount of support. Hans is in charge of presiding over this debate, and if the ultimate decision of the people was to abandon the city and move away, quote, both proposals had advantages and difficulties, and they drew about the same amount of support. Hans was in charge of presiding over this debate, and if the ultimate decision of the people was to abandon the city and move away, he had no choice but to follow their will. But he's ultimately conflicted because his friend Galliman designed the Crystal City, Mars City, and a mass exodus would obviously upset his friend. <sighs> Corruption. Now, Chania, one of the Mercury group, sends a letter to say that they should all protest against the competitive nature of the Martian society. Quote, as if trophies were the measure of life. There are positive and negative reactions from the rest of the group. Lu Ying reflects on one message from Runge who says the Mercury group was just a political bargaining tool. Quote, We were nothing but hostages, a pledge to secure the negotiations with Earth so that they could obtain more resources. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. We learn a little about Rainey's background now. He's a bit of a lost soul. Quote, More than a decade ago, after he joined his first atelier, he had been punished due to an accident. For five years, he wasn't allowed to apply for research or production funding. A year after the accident, his girlfriend passed away with him. On Mars, singles were assigned single occupancy dorm units but could never get the chance to choose a house with a yard. He goes on. The experience of being punished changed him and made him lose interest in pursuing what others desired. Although he does tell Le Yong, quote, for a world to function, it must be built upon desire. It's quite interesting, this analysis of Rainey and his idea of desire. It seems to be set up as an opposition to much religious thinking, which often seeks to limit desire. He believes strongly that he gets happiness from, quote, sobriety and the freedoms to be sober. How dull. <laughs> the chapter closes with a message from Luang's friend, Anger, who says he can take her to the registry of files. So Lu Ying meets up with her friends and we learn that her costume was sabotaged by a thin layer of, quote, high magnetic moment material. Dun, dun, dun. So her injury was not an accident. Was it Hans wanting to get rid of her? Right? Or is that a red herring? He doesn't want her to discover the truth behind her parents' death, surely. Now, Rudy ultimately admits that it was his fault, that he wanted her to jump higher. That's what he says. I think this may be a cover for something more nefarious. Shania is outraged and says, quote, A human being simply needs to jump at the height of a human being. An anchor gives Luang a note that allows her access to the registry run by her uncle Lark. I wonder what she's going to discover there. The chapter and the first half ends with a description of the architecture of Mars and Rainy, reflecting on whether the people will decide to leave Mars City or not. I don't really care either way. So initial thoughts. It's been quite an interesting first half. I found the whole festival of dance a bit kind of childish and the leaping high conspiracy a bit problematic. What was the point of her being injured? How did that help the plot? There's been some very interesting ideas about the difference between a life on Mars, rigorous and structured, and a life on Earth, which allows much more freedom. There's also that question of whether the life on Earth is actually freer or not, because we have that commercialization of artistic projects, and whereas on Mars, art does not have a price and doesn't depend on a commercial outlet. So those questions were quite interesting. Will Jung find out exactly why she was sent to Earth? And what is the treasure the Terrans are fighting over? I have a feeling it will be something intangible like desire for better things, as I said. And what did Davosky do on Earth to build the archive? And why doesn't Luang just question her grandfather outright? Why did you send my parents away? We have the question, will Earth and Mars end up 
being united in sweet love, not war. For that matter, will Eco and Luang get together? I doubt it, since Eco has now gone back to Earth. Will Luang learn what real freedom is? And will it be based in any one society, Earth or Mars? Or will she discover that freedom is a personal inner concept not defined by society? And why does she love her grandfather when she knows he was responsible for her loving parents' deaths? Halfway through the book, she thinks of the Martian people. Quote, when I first heard them call grandfather a dictator, my first reaction was shock and rage. It wasn't just the natural instinct to defend someone I love, but more important, grandfather was a hero of Mars. I could understand that the Terrans would view him as an enemy, but not that he would be called a cold-blooded tyrant. Here's the difference. An enemy of the Terrans could still be a hero of the Martians, but a tyrant would be an enemy of the Martians as well. And then we've got that question. Is Dr. Rainey going to end up doing something horrible to Loan? He was portrayed as such a nice professional man, someone your daughter should marry, but as I say, I don't trust him. And what is the matter of engineering that Renini helped Hans Sloan and was really set up to cause Luang's injury? And of course, what will Luang discover about her parents and Hans in the files of the registry? And will there be a revolution on Mars? Quote, boycotting the creativity fair and stopping all the competitions some very interesting ideas came out of that first half. It was interesting the use of earthy phrases. When Ellie, the co-captain of the May Earth, and the young girl meet for the first time, Yi Luong, she's described by the narrator Lus. Quote, her pose was graceful like a tree in winter. The narrator continues, a blue spherical lamp hung above the door, illuminating the old woman and the youth as gently as the moon. And Luong moved with, quote, the tips of her toes pointing slightly outward and glided away as light and graceful as a striding crane. We have old man's fingers moving in the dying sunlight like the jagged fringe of an iceberg. And in an eco's hotel room, most of the furniture was connected to the walls so that the desk, bed and dresser were like turns taken by a surging stream through the mountains, forming a coherent hole in which the curve of the desk was like the crest of a furled wave. And then a vacuum cleaner crawls along the foot of the wall like a turtle. All these earthy, untechnological images, a tree, the moon, a crane, flesh and blood, seem to hark back to a real sense of history, and of natural beauty, and the sense of wonder of life. They remind me of those distilled haikus that capture a fleeting thought or experience, and are often contemplative of nature. They're very rooted in the earthy experience. I wonder why. In a technological sci-fi novel, this feels quite refreshing. Another idea is shattered preconceptions. Eco considers anew the architecture of Mars. Quote, he had always thought that on Mars a precise, clean, mechanical aesthetic would reign supreme, but the reality turned out to be humane and natural, as though he had walked into a distant vale far from urban bustle. Mars isn't the cold and clinical world that everyone from Earth presumed. For example, we have that interesting idea of Mars surveillance. Eco's hotel room had glass walls, and we ultimately find out that the glass is there not because of surveillance, but because that is the resource that they have available. And it can be tinted so that it turns opaque, but no one does. Communist Mars, obviously, you don't need train tickets. And on Mars, quote, the land was literally a thing of the people, managed for the common will. There was no private ownership in real estate, no smuggling, no buying on credit, no banking. No one knew how children who had grown up in such a place would react to the grand bazaar that was Earth. This also comes with a rigorous hierarchy. When Luyen arrives home, she reflects on the atelier. She must choose in order to define her life. But, quote, during her five years on Earth, she moved 14 times and lived in 12 different cities. She tried out seven different jobs and built up five different groups of friends. She lost all certainty that she knew how to plan the rest of her life. She could no longer accept the monotony. She found hierarchy revolting. What had seemed to her the natural order of life in childhood now appeared as unbearable restraints. She wished she felt otherwise, but there it was. And we also have this idea of manufactured desire on earth. Tutu says, quote, my teacher told us that Terrans love to manufacture non-existent desires and needs. Eco was startled. Tutu was right. The heart of commerce was desire, and when desires were satisfied, new needs must be manufactured. Whoever managed to create a new desire would own that market. The principle was familiar to everyone, but hearing it from the mouth of a child was something else. It meant the Martian education focused on the faults of a market economy from an early age. Another difference, the value of silence on Mars. Rudy says, quote, he knew the value of being silent compared to bucolic, shouty Earth. 
There's an interesting idea about prejudice and the lack of cultural understanding. The Martian and Terran delegation at the Gloria Memorial Hall is supposed to show off Martian agriculture and by using cotton tablecloths, which is a rare luxury. But to the Terran delegates, quote, the whole setup reminded them of some third-rate country buffet and they conversed loudly among themselves, describing how their own countries would have hosted such an important state dinner in style. This really reminds me a bit of when Rochester, with his lack of understanding for the traditions of the Caribbean, criticises the women for not lifting their dresses as they walk in the previous book, Why Sargasso Sea. Now, the reason glass is popular is not due to surveillance, but because of raw materials on Mars. On Mars, they don't have an internet, but a centralised server controlling information. Quote, the mainstream media on Earth had always been proud of a long tradition of atomistic individualism. The very idea of uniting everyone with a centralised server would be subject to vociferous criticism. Again, the Terrans believe Mars is an autocracy, but it isn't according to Eco. Quote, do you remember the Martian consul speech last night about democracy? I spoke to one of the Martian legislators after the reception and he explained that the bull is responsible for most day-to-day -day decisions and engineering projects, but major decisions that affect everyone have to be put to a vote by all the citizens of Mars. That doesn't jive with what we usually hear on Earth. It is rather different, Peter acknowledged. So what do you make of this difference? We have a representative democracy with free and fair elections, but they don't have elections at all. They do have plebiscites involving everyone. He goes on. Right now, everyone on Earth thinks of Mars as an autocracy. My film may challenge this consensus and lead to unpredictable results. But I don't think a plebiscite necessarily makes a democracy. I think the author is touting some strange philosophies on politics. She's very sensitive and in a difficult position. I know she lives and works in China, so dealing with sensitive political arguments like this must be a challenge for an author in this environment. What do you think? Now, is the implied narrator Martian? When Luying and Eco meet at the tower in the shared digital space, the narrator says of Eco, quote, he was on a vast virtual plaza, uncertain where to go. We often come here to air our views, to bridge distances, wonderful times. Those last two sentences are surely from the point of view of a Martian. The implied narrator is surely Martian, don't you think? What do you think? Now, we also had in this first half some beautiful poetic descriptions of Mars. They are rare within the book, but here are a few of my favourite descriptions. Quote, The myths of Mars were generated by the endless red deserts. The myths had wings that took off from dust storms. They were rough, fresh, speedy, barren, devoid of the romance of verdant hills and babbling brooks, bereft of the mysteries of dark forests. All they had was striving flight, leaving behind dust, passing through swirling sand, dodging explosions to head for the sun, to embrace the desert as hard as iron, as light as birds. Faced with the gigantic steel warships of Earth, the Martians were like moths plunging towards the flame, tragic and resolute. And some beautiful descriptions of dance. Quote, Lu Ying stretched out her arms, her wrists together before her chest, fingers splayed away from each other. In the darkness, the golden threads in her cuffs glowed faintly like the Milky Way across the night sky over a wilderness. Gradually, the dark theatre was filled with a soundscape. Howling winds, a distant clarion, cowhide drums and singing zither. Elders telling legends from a thousand years ago by the sea. Blood and glory, trembling between teeth and tongue. Dead souls dancing in the wind. The clarion faded as a bamboo flute began to play. Memory traversed space and the show began. Wow, I want to see that show. We have an interesting symbol in the book of light and the idea of broken light. Being a constant theme really, the clear glass buildings and Mars that allow light through reflect their love of knowledge and it's also an excuse for Terrans to criticise what they see as a surveillance culture. Um, there's an interesting quote from Dvosky. He says, quote, language is the mirror of the light. Don't forget the light by focusing on the mirror. And then we have the Tower of Babel as well, made of glass. Theon is going to profit from the trip to Mars. Eco, however, reflects on how he wants to, quote, gather all the mirrors in the world and piece together the broken light. Dr. Rainey is an interesting character. He really represents a profession or the idea of a profession having good personal qualities. Remember, he's only 33. He's put into the story two thirds through with no backstory whatsoever. It appears that just because he's a doctor, he commands respect. He seems to know everything about the war and about Leering's family. He represents the perfect professional person. 
And here's a typical crying description of how he acts with Lu Ying. Quote, Lu Ying gave Dr. Rainey a grateful smile. She didn't know him well, but she felt comfortable telling him these thoughts because she could sense his generous spirit. He gave off a deep serenity that she wanted to possess one day herself. He was really impatient and explained everything to her calmly. From time to time, she suffered from bouts of sorrow or anger, and he would try to explain the reasons behind various events, allowing her a chance to contextualise her emotions in the flow of history and time. His exclamations felt steady and dispassionate, like trees that defied the storm on a snowy mountain. Is it blindingly obvious that he is going to end up evil, doing some dastardly deed to Loing? I think so. But I'm thinking it less and less throughout this half. Anyway, just a few thoughts on the book. I'd love to hear what you found really interesting in that first half. I'd now like to share some of your thoughts on last month's book, The Castle by Franz Kafka. There's some wonderful comments on the web and on Goodreads. Siti uh, Shakura Sahami said of The Castle, quote, At first I thought I had no idea what I'm doing and what I'm reading. I read about this one. Somehow the experience created a strange environment for me. But what made me hooked to the book until the end is that the themes I had towards K throughout the book. Sometimes I supported him, sometimes I despised him. And Kafka's work made me unsure of myself, of what's right and what's wrong. Playing with my thoughts and emotions, I say, makes this book an interesting read. I'd love to read more of it, but the questions it left me at the end somehow seems odd, especially on the dress. An odd read, but interesting. And Jeff Jackson said, quote, Ratings seem especially beside the point with the castle. If you have any affinity for Kafka, it's worth your time. It contains some of his strangest and most disturbing images. The sound of singing children coming out of phone receivers and the bone-deep feeling of being lost in a world whose rules we can't even fail to grasp. But it's also unfinished and there are moments late in the novel where you can feel Kafka spinning his wheels, getting lost within the continually forking paths of his character's self-justifications. It's hard to imagine how the book could have ended and in some ways mid-sentence seems as good a place as any. And J.M. Hushaw said, quote, A fine setting for a fit of despair. One has to wonder how much of the adulation from this work is simply because it is Kafka. This novel is indefensibly uninteresting and pointless, leaving aside the idea that Kafka might have spent a lot of time writing a 400-plus page novel about pointlessness, which is stretching things a bit far, even for Kafka. It might be easier and more considerate to say that he just isn't a very good writer. This has increasingly become my conviction, rereading all these works that my younger incarnation regarded highly, probably simply because they were Kafka. You see where I'm going here. Almost cultic adulation can often blind one to the deficiencies of the source of one's admiration. We're certainly seeing a lot of that these days, but it extends to the arts as well. A brutally and excruciatingly dull novel cannot by its maker be redeemed. Anyway, I couldn't get past a third of this dull thing. Imagine the trial extended into a bloated HBO series and you'll have the castle. Matters aren't helped by the fact that Kafka died before finishing it, though the ending is often guessed at. And then Anna said, An alluringly bizarre book this is. Therefore, I know for sure that it could never had a proper ending. This book is not about an ending itself. This book, with its depressing Shakespearean tone, has more to offer life. This book is life and I'm not saying this as a motto on a picture posted on Instagram. I do say this because life is back and forthy with its deliciously ambiguous subjectivity. I did tend to watch all of this theatrical book in a more amused manner, frowning at times but only to be even more relieved afterwards. That's because everything that is said or done in this book is merely nothing. Everybody has a different opinion. Everything seems to be coerced by a force that is not the castle itself but the unknown gap that people build. Within the characters, their development, untrustworthy suppositions, horrific backgrounds, Kafka tries to capture the comfort as well as the not granted urges that come inside the outlandish. It is indeed a journey, a diary of presumptions, a forgotten chase of a stubborn and enthralling scene of the same never-changing framework of pure opinions that can be taken into account or just erased. And it is catching. That's due to the fact that you get caught too. You do not know what to believe. Every action dissolves a saying and every saying is a futile choice of words. There are certain things that are known, but Kafka gets rid of them all slowly as to give the impression not only of a carousel, but of a meant-to-be disorder in the end no matter what. That reminds me a little bit of Kafka, that review. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them leave a comment below. Or if you're listening to the episode, send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. 
I'd also love suggestions for future books to read together. Maybe there's been one sitting on your shelf for ages which you haven't got round to reading and you just need that push to get started. Talking of next books, after I've discussed the second half of Vagabonds in two weeks, that's the 30th of December, January's two episodes will be all about Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo, the Mexican. So get that one at the ready if you can. Also, if you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe or give it five stars on your episode app. Thanks. Anyway, I look forward to discussing the last half of Vagabonds in three weeks' time. See you then. (laughs) 